What I want to sort of my, my talk today is looking at in terms of innovation and management capability in Ireland and implications for policy making and business and, and society. And I suppose if you look at uh, innovation, I suppose we, you know, we have a number of, of, of different sort of perspectives uh, here and, and, and different different areas. If you were to look at um, innovation as, as a word, what sort of uh, uh, terminology or thoughts in terms of come to you in terms of defining what innovation is? So I'm conscious that you have multidisciplinary sort of perspectives here in terms of you know the word innovation. So what does innovation mean in terms of maybe from your particular sort of perspective or context? New. New. So you're looking at challenging old or you know sort of conventional sort of perspectives or whatever. Yeah. What else are you when you think of innovation? Creativity. Creativity. So there's some element in order to sort of challenge. Think of something new, you have to have some sort of creative process in place, some creativity. What else? Continuous improvement. Yeah. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-self uh, activity. So so far you've described activities. But what is what what, what do you want to achieve in terms of outcome wise when you're innovation? Yeah. So you want to have so, some sort of contribution. So what would those contributions look like? Money. Money, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Wealth. So you want to create some sort of capital. So grow, a, a, you know, capital from an economic point of view. It could be social as well. Yeah. Social capital could be yeah. social capital. When you mean social capital, what, what specifically, if you were to follow that? So you look at applying innovative practices or understandings, social PR around sort of the social contribution. So how would that manifest itself in activities or practices? What, what, what are you trying to do in terms of the innovation? Ultimately, what, you know, if you're looking at kind of a sort of community development or looking at social and economic innovation, what are you? Essentially, trying to get at. Um, yeah. So development. <coughs> Absolutely. But what, 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 what's the purpose of it? To develop better ways of doing things. Okay. Whether it's more efficient or whether it's uh, actually just more locally specific. Or yep. So you're really looking at in terms of looking at behavioural changes. Absolutely. Better ways of. Uh, you know, deploying a service or a product or an activity. So, for an economic point of view, you're saying, okay, in a business, is there better ways that we can deploy our existing resources and assets in order to generate a return for our shareholders? In a social innovation space, you're saying, okay, are there different ways that we can really tackle a particular issue to actually have you know fundamental behavioural changes uh, so that we are you know helping or intervening with you know families that are having difficulties in terms of sustaining communities that are, are in danger of. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, economic uh, sort of uh, impairment and all that. And you're really looking at it, behavioural change, so you're looking at it from a, an individual point of view. And institutional. Yep, yep. Institutional. Society. And a society, yep. So you look at, let's say, the drinks companies, for example, and the drinks companies, you know, you know every art that they have is, you know, drink responsibly. You know, what a... Uh, an oxymoron that is, you know, is that for all, all the ads. In some senses, they're looking at in terms of sort of you know contribution in terms of their own sort of development in terms of uh, uh, you know wealth management and, and growing their business. But also they are saying, okay, well we have to have a, a, a social contribution. And again, I suppose the word innovation, you know, will mean different things to different people because we're coming up from sort of different perspectives. But all of those sort of factors that you describe in terms of the activities, the outcomes. And also, I suppose it is about, what I would argue, my, from my own sort of perspective, 
it's about it's about strategic sort of, sort of long term perspective. So you're you're looking at in terms of it over a long sort of period of, of time. And really, I suppose what I want to sort of cover sort of this morning is, is in, in really looking at what I would see as some of the fundamental changes, irrespective of whether you're in communities based development or sort of the economic innovation space, what are fundamentally going to challenge our society. Looking at then is, well, how does Ireland, as, as from, a, from an economic perspective, we have this national innovation system, there's a huge list on it, and how Ireland has performed. So look at it in terms of the policy issues. And then looking at, okay, well, what has happened at a firm level, and then looking at what I would see as you know, sort of the fundamental sort of invisible capability that you have to have for innovation is management capability. So you have people operating in both voluntary, civil society, public sector, uh, and, and businesses that have a very strong management capability in order to deliver on the services or the different activities that they're tasked to do. It. And then finally, I'll, I'll wrap up in terms of looking at the implications for, for policy making. So let's start with some of the structural changes. Reality is we're facing a death watch challenge. What do I mean by that? Is that our economy is going to lose a lot of economic activity to other countries. So if you look at a country like Macedonia, and if I asked you to put a map of Europe up there, would you be able to pick out Macedonia out of the European states? But Macedonia has basically replicated the innovation uh, policy and practices uh, out from Ireland. As you can see, it has very low flat rate tax rates, uh, profit, you know, reinvest at 0%, company registration, three, three days, you know, all of these sort of things. And really, I suppose, the, the big challenges for our economy is that we have this dual economy. So on one hand, we're very, very dependent on foreign direct investment and, and foreign direct investment companies in Ireland. And then there is the other side in terms of the smaller indigenous industry. So if you take, let's say, statistics from, let's say, 2000, 2007, Ireland was the number one location of choice for foreign direct investment, uh, for US uh, uh, foreign direct investment. That's ahead of India and China. So there are some things in terms of the, the low corporation tax, it's maybe the management capability, it's a whole lot of different uh, factors that have made us competitive. But the competition now is very much in terms of exploiting assets, uh, you know, let's say from the foreign direct in terms of manufacturing, all of these sort of things. The big challenge then is to sort of bring it, you know, change our economy from this exploitive capacity to try to move it towards more innovation, research and, and development and all of that. So then the issue then is how do we actually uh, maintain our, our competitive advantage at a national level, at a regional level and also in terms of individual level. So the skills, the capability and that goes right across, across the economy. What I would see as, as some of the fundamental structural changes are is the, I would make an argument that the financial crisis that we are currently experiencing is about a failure of management and about governance in business. Is that, you know, proper governance, you know, you have boards of directors, all of these sort of things. But all of it, you know, has, has contributed to the sort of economic sort of crisis that we're in. But from that, that has then forced companies to look at, well, how do they actually, you know, maintain sort of some degree of creativity? How do they ensure continued improvement? And look at in terms of their contributions much broader than just the economic contributions. You know, corporate social responsibility, all of these sort of things. Also, you see sort of companies out the, at, the, you know, at the very forefront in terms of experimenting with uh, new ways of organising work and organising organisations. And looking at how can they actually uh, sort of pool and, and leverage all of the sort of knowledge and capability outside of, uh, you know, within their company, but also outside it. So if you look at Google, so it's a classic example of this new management revolution in terms of the way that they've organised the physical work environment is, is very, very different to traditional sort of office environments. The way that they've incentivised people to work, I think 70% of your time working on Google stuff, uh, 20 and 10% then is split between sort of issues that you want to work on yourself or within a group. So that's why Google claimed that they can do sort of market research within from 25 minutes down now to 15 minutes. And that's why you have all these Google Arts and all of these wonderful applications that they would claim to have, because that they are creating this, you know, leveraging in terms of the creative capacity of individuals. Also, science and technology is growing very, very rapidly. So uh, recently I was at a, at a conference there, and you look at in terms of biometric technology, so you look at the iris scanning that we have, and all that as, as a, a, you know, quickly uh, in terms of the US federal space in terms of securities. Now you're looking at in terms of vascular biometrics. So each of us has a different vascular structure, uh, in terms of our, you know, the, the science behind it, I don't know the ins and outs of it. 
But you see in terms of that is driving uh, sort of the rapid advances and also it's presenting convergent opportunities where companies are saying, okay, I'm a software company or I'm a biotechnology company, and really sort of the opportunities I have are very, very limited, but I need to begin to collaborate with players in different markets and also to involve uh, sort of society in a very, very different way. The reality is, I suppose, the Asian central bankers and also, um, I suppose, the oil producing companies, have, our countries, have the capital resources going forward. So their view and their perspective on innovation, how, how they you know, view organisations, and their long-term perspective is going to have a, an impact in terms of the way innovation evolves in economies and societies. Rapid scale of global companies, very, very easy to do these days, but also the collaborative model around innovation is changing. So you're looking at now sort of, let's say, IBM that set up Blade.org, and they have taken, they've set up a non-for-profit. Non and they have said, in this non-for-profit entity that is part of IBM, but it's, it's, it's not part of their, their family in, in, in some senses, that they've invited a whole lot of different companies to come in and exploit their blade server technology. So this is for their big uh, servers. So what does that do? So they have some sense that they're taking principles around communities and uh, social capital and using it for economic purposes so they can actually begin to have a competitive response and to be competitive in relation to their innovation activities. If you look at sort of literature on sort of innovation, it's very, very, very broad. Uh, you have a whole lot of sorts of definitions in terms of what innovation is from product process, service innovation, and, and more likely management innovation. And I suppose you know, look at sort of two sort of, sort of key authors there, Drucker and, and Pfeffer. And, and again, I suppose they have maybe in some ways contradictory, but also uh, you know, sort of common sort of perspectives. Drucker would very much say that innovation and, and, and also entrepreneurship is very much about the doing of the do. It's about practicing, it's about you know, going out doing it again and again and perfecting it in a more, more long term. And also, I suppose, Fred talks about innovation change in almost any way requires the skills to have uh, the power and the willingness to employ to get things accomplished. So, what you described there initially was sort of activities, but ultimately you're looking at you know, substantial endpoint activities. That, you know, from a, from a firm point of view, you're looking at to make competitive gains in the marketplace, <coughs> getting more customers. If you look at it in terms of the social sort of space in terms of innovation, you're saying, let's say, from a taxpayer's point of view, that you are delivering or you're, you're contributing services in a more effective way. But also it's about, innovation is about, you know, fundamentally it's about partnership. It is about looking at in terms of leveraging the different assets, uh, you know, in, in, in society in terms of, of delivering innovative activity. And also it's about mindset and, and collective action. So you look at in terms of uh, sort of companies that are highly innovative like GE or, or, or 3M and, and those, that they have a culture that innovation you know, uh, really transcends all of the organisation. The challenge then is in terms of, but that's very easy too because you have an outcome which is very much uh, a, a profit orientated. So if you try and do that in terms of a community development group where you're really sort of your objectives are, are very much broader, maybe they're not as well defined, then it becomes more and more challenging uh, to deliver on, on an innovation agenda. You look at it in terms of innovation through a life cycle, and, and again, it's just to give you a sense in terms of the different uh, forms of innovation. So you have everything in terms of product innovation, maybe to begin with, you look at some sort of process innovation, so once you get into the market, you're looking at, okay, is there different, better ways we can deliver the product or service? Maybe some form of experiential innovation, marketing innovation, business model innovation, and structural innovation. So there's all forms of, of innovation uh, right through sort of a, a life cycle of, a, of an activity. <coughs> For me, if I, my sort of disciplinary is from sort of strategic management, and I would see innovation as very much a business strategy issue. So you're looking at in terms of, here's my long-term sort of perspective, as Rob was saying, in terms of what I want to achieve as, as an academic or as a researcher. So how am I going to be different and unique? And ultimately, what is my purpose in terms of, of uh, continuing that activity? Looking at, okay, well, how am I going to stand out from all of these different players in the market? So if you look at even the classic water companies, how water companies differentiated from an innovation point of view, a simple product like water? How oh, they don't? Yeah, go away. No, like to from Cork, so we'll have to very quickly. Yeah, so they have localised it. What else have they done in terms of uh, you know, being innovative? I'm trying to say we're different. So we're different in terms of maybe uh, location. We're going to high quality products. Yes. Uh, these are the Air Force companies, so they have a water stand where you can buy a glass of water for five euros. Yeah. So, yeah, so in some sense, they've talked about an experience. 
you know, that, and also in terms of that there's some uh, added value quality in terms of drinking water. What else have they done? And so how do they manifest that lifestyle in terms of the color chakra? The Valkyrie Challenge. The Valkyrie Challenge. And you look at around, in this room, you look at the different type of water bottles that you have. So you have the sports one that you're drinking from. You have the big liter one there, which is a liter one. You have a bigger one there. So they have different bottles yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. But again, it is in terms of fitting with different needs that you have. And you look at it in terms of coffee cups, the same again, in terms of this this of differentiation. And it means in terms of competitors. So, well, will we know the difference in a blind test between Galway, Tipperary, or Bob? Probably not. Uh, and, and that. But I mean, again, it's about you know being very, very distinct in the marketplace. Then you look at it in terms of competitiveness, about you know delivering a bottom line impact. So, some water companies like Volvic are saying, look, they're, they're contributing back, uh, you know, to the broader society in terms of the projects that they're involved in. You know, fair trade, all these sort of organisations. And you're right in terms of some of the issues, like it's about change, it's about you know, looking at collaborating with different actors. It's also about experimenting, but in terms of a lot of organisations are afraid to experiment because they're, they're afraid of the risks involved. And also it is really about understanding your context. And you know, for me, in terms of coming from a strategy point of view, and, and Minsport talks about this in his writings, it's about mastery of detail. So if you were to be effective in sort of whatever context or discipline area you are in, and particularly from a sort of public policy point of view, that mastery of context, so your ability to actually see the issues, understand the issues from a multiple stakeholder perspective. So in some senses, you may necessarily not have walked the walk with people, but that you have a real understanding of fundamentally what are the real challenges and issues that they have. And if I take from the economic point of view, let's say Tesco, when they went into the US market, probably one of the most competitive markets that they have, that, that's there, and they're co competing against the big gorilla of, of uh, uh, Walmart, that they force, you know, or they told a number of their managers, but maybe 100 and 200 of them, to actually live with US families of all different socioeconomic groups. Because their sort of mission in the world, or part of the world, is to maximize customer loyalty from each one of you. So if you're looking at trying to maximize customer loyalty, therefore you have to understand well, where are the opportunities are, and also in terms of what sort of policy services we necessarily deliver. Others, like if you look at Aldi and all that in terms of experimentation, they would say, okay, well, let's try things for maybe in, in three or four stores if they work in terms of product categories rolled out through the whole network. And again, if you look at it in terms of the social innovation, there's a lot of sort of pilot projects are launched with great fanfare from, from ministers and all of that, but they're cut short or they're lack funding in terms of the long-term sort of impact that they would have. That in some senses, uh, the, the bridge is, uh, is rolled up before they have, you know, they can really assess their, their true uh, capabilities. Also, is just being innovative on its own is just not enough. If I look at the sort of classic example in, in sort of the sort of business and strategy literature, it's of, of, of one company, the uh, Volkswagen uh, Audi Group. And on one hand, you have the Audi A6, which was uh, launched, uh, the, the new model was launched a number of years ago, and claimed that it had more patents registered for that car uh, than NASA did in that year. So that's a big claim to make. And very much aligned to their fit and purpose of what they do, which is Deutschland technique, which is you know, technical excellence. And when you look at that, is that you know, that very much fits in terms of where, where they're you know, positioning their, their car and their brand. Same group, different uh, brand, and that is the Volkswagen Phaeton, probably their, their very rare species on the road. And Volkswagen developed this car to really sort of say to the world, we've, we've arrived again. We are very resurgent in terms of our brand post the, the launch of the Volkswagen Golf. And, and the Passat, they were very uh, uh, competitive and very successful uh, relaunches. They launched this, this, this car. It says, the same patents all that has because there's cross sharing of technology. And the first year in the UK market, they had a spectacular success. I think they only sold about 48. And why did they only sell 48 Volkswagen Phaeton cars at the high end, like the Audi A6? Why didn't they sell as effectively for Volkswagen as they initially thought? Absolutely. If you can have that money, you won't be buying a boat. Simple as that. You know, it, it's it, it, you know, it's a technically excellent car, all those sort of things. But is that you know there is a certain marquee, and, and people don't associate the brand with that level of, of innovative activity, or doesn't fit in terms of the customer expectations. So, looking at in terms of the innovation value chain, and, and I suppose 
that's one of the reasons that I sort of suggest that you have a look at for, for your uh, for the summer school. And again, I suppose it's to reflect in terms of your own context, and in terms of when you look at maybe principal research as it was described uh, there this morning, is you really want to see in terms of well, what is the innovative capacity and, and the value chain of a particular organization or entity that you're looking at. Because you really want to say, okay, well, how do organizations generate ideas? How do they actually sort of, you know, select those ideas? And actually, how do they implement those ideas? So Hansen's and, and Birkenshaw's really very much, in some senses, outlining some of the key issues. And also, in terms of looking at, well, what are the performance indicators that you, you'd want to be looking out for to see that there's evidence of, in terms of uh, uh, innovation activity in a particular context? So again, it's just a sort of by way of, of sort of uh, reference there, just to look at it in terms of your own sort of, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of perspectives. And really to see in terms of, well, organizations might say they're innovate, in, innovative and, 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 and that, but how, do, how does this manifest itself in, in an organizational sense in a, from a day-to-day -day sort of reality? So what I want to now look at is in terms of sort of the national innovation system sort of literature, and look at it in terms of, well, how is Ireland performed in terms of innovation policy? I suppose the innovation policy in Ireland has very much been driven from a sort of science and technology point of view. I suppose the social sciences find it very, very difficult uh, to get a look in. But what we have in terms of skill sets, in terms of social science graduates, is what the science and technology uh, you know, graduates want and need in terms of, to be actually successful in terms of commercialisation of their technology. And what do we mean by a national innovation system? And it's really saying, okay, well, you have all of these assets and resources in your economy, uh, from some maybe technology assets, uh, you have maybe socio-economic institutions, uh, right across the, the whole economic uh, uh, sphere, social and economic sphere. And also you have sort of uh, policy makers and also individual firms and other actors. And if you put all of those together, you know, they form what Lundval and others describe as this national innovation system. So you have national innovation systems, you could have regional innovation systems, or, or you could have industrial clusters. And I know sort of Magella Giblin and uh, Will Gagan will be sort of looking at these issues over the course of, of the week in terms of their presentations. Also having a very competitive national innovation system is very, very important for competitiveness. Because if you want to continue to attract foreign direct investment, if you want to be up at the frontier in terms of being seen as being a highly innovative economy, then all of these actors have to work together. And as Lundvall sort of very succinctly puts this, the functioning of any innovation system reflects the fact that innovation results represent a combination of private and public goods. So in some senses, you know, the ERSI or Enterprise Ireland, or you look at, um, you know, let's say, the, the, uh, or having a chief science officer in the state, having a chief medical officer, and some of those things are public good activities. They're necessary for the functioning of our society. But also they're necessary to combine those activities with private good activities and assets in order to allow companies to compete very, very effectively. And if you look at sort of policy context in Ireland, so we you know, think about it in terms of just how innovative we were in terms of attracting Intel. You know, you know, at a time where we had no track record of sort of technological sort of capacity within the economy. So, you know, in some senses, you know, the, sort of the story goes is, is that it was down to Intel were interested in Ireland, they were interested in terms of the incentives were there, in terms of the low tax environment, all these things about education. But their big concern was, would there be people in Ireland willing to work for Intel? I think IDA at the time, you know, produced, I think, 500 CVs of individuals that were willing to move from different parts of the world and from Ireland that are willing to work from Intel. And if you look at that sort of, the sort of Cultural Report was the first sort of significant sort of policy uh, document that really said, okay, sort of say, okay, if Ireland wants to compete internationally and wants to attract all this foreign direct investment and wants to grow its economy and also its society, then it has to make some investments in terms of infrastructure, education, science and, and technology. And again, you know, a lot of the sort of things that we take for granted in terms of the grant schemes and all that has its uh, origins in terms of the Cultural Report. Then... You look at in terms of the next major sort of policy initiative was the Enterprise Strategy uh, Group report chaired by Ono Driscoll, who's one of the International Advisory Board members for the Irish Social Sciences Platform. And again, well, again, this was an attempt to say, okay, well, here are the essential com uh, competitive conditions that Ireland needs to achieve in order to then look at in terms of developing some competitive advantage and ultimately generating sustainable enterprises. But now we look at in terms of how far we've fallen behind in terms of cost competitiveness. <laughs> Our physical infrastructure and communications is patchy, to say the least. But in some senses, we have excelled very much in terms of the soft side of our economy. 
in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship capacity is you know, quite uh, favourable and quite comparable. And also in terms of, which is not looked at quite a lot, is that we have a strong management capability in our economy relative to the length of, of time in terms of how long we are a, 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 as, a, as a democracy. And in some senses, this was you know, an initial sort of pass in terms of how we look at in terms of innovation policy in Ireland. Then roll on two years later. So you have the strategy for science, technology, innovation. And some of you are beneficiaries of that in some shape or form by virtue of you know, the funding that, that has accrued. And again, the, this is about the vision and the strategy. It's about you know, Ireland by 2013 will be internationally renowned for its excellence in research and will be generating in the forefront of, and using new knowledge for economic and social progress within an innovation-driven culture. Again, I think it's very interesting is that it's just not a purely economic sort of focus in terms of SSTI, that there is a social agenda in some shape or form. And again, you look at the investment of 8.2 billion over, so I say, from 20, or, or, uh, 07 to 2013. Reality, that is nowhere near in terms of the level of investment that we need. That is absolutely you know, a minuscule amount of uh, investment to bring us and to bootstrap us up from a very low level of activity where there was you know, very much patchy investment in science technology, both at industry and at state level in the 80s. And this is what the innovation, sort of national innovation system looks like, uh, taken from the SSTI. So it's about building a critical mass in science, looking at in terms of looking at bringing this technology out into uh, different areas. It's then saying to different arenas to look at how do you commercialise your research, bring it out into marketplace. How then falls into firms and, and develop their sort of technical and research capability. That will bring you some success in markets, and then you have some sort of finance in terms of innovation and research. All sounds and looks very, very simplistic uh, there, but it's hugely challenging. Because again, this strategy says it's economic and social, but yet it's about building up a scientific base. So where do you see in terms of where is the social dimension within the building a scientific base? Or is there a social dimension in building a strong scientific base? Well, if you're creating jobs and yeah. opportunities for high skilled work, absolutely. You're creating <coughs> opportunities in terms of from an economic point of view, but also if you're building a strong scientific and, and uh, you know, technology base, it also allows you maybe to develop new products and services to actually go for you know, the aging population, to look at in terms of new business models and new business processes, to look at you know, very you know, social issues uh, as well as economic issues. The reality is, I suppose, is that you know, it's very, very difficult to come late in the game to build a strong critical mass. So if I give you a statistic, if you take the top performing US universities in terms of commercialization and research and technology income, and if you marry them in terms of, you take the top, they will equate to the top 74 uh, universities in the UK. So if you take, let's say, MIT, all of these sort of uh, big plates. So in terms of just the scale effect, uh, it is huge. Is that you're going, you're competing against big gorillas uh, you know, internationally in terms of trying to develop a, a science base. So what you're looking at is looking at new sort of pockets of research or looking at sort of collaboration. Last year, towards the end of last year, again this, this innovation policy statement comes out from uh, Mary Cochrane's office, uh, really stating again Ireland's ambition to become an innovation leader, our goal is to develop an innovation driven economy that means competitive advantage and increases productivity and again it's put an, an innovation at the core of our policies. Yet, as, as Rob was, was saying in terms of his talk, it's very, very difficult even for large organisations like the American Chamber of Commerce, different lobby groups, to actually get government to move on sort of very, very simple and you would say very straight, straightforward policy issues around taxation, about you know, uh, broadening sort of uh, investing in terms of skills, you know, or maybe look at fundamentally looking at the education system to actually equip the country for the, the uh, big sort of challenges ahead in terms of the innovation agenda. And then, all of this goes slightly askew because of the current economic climate. So we have had Cullerton, Enterprise Strategy Group, Innovation, Strategy for Science, Technology, Innovation. Now we have an innovation policy. And now you see the sands of policy shifting again. So we start off with all this sort of economic and social. And you see in terms of the documents going forward is that there's very little mention of, of, of society. It's very much an economic focus. And again, it's about combining the sort of successful elements of an enterprise economy, the innovation of ideas, and again, it's about this now changing the game to saying, okay, become a commercialization hub. 
So that's very, very much different from what, what was articulated in terms of the strategy for science, technology and innovation. But interestingly, if you go and read that 100-page document, they were very much saying is that it's about developing human capital. It's about developing a very much a physical capital, so an infrastructural base within the, the country. It's also about developing and protecting an environmental capital, so, so sustainability of, of communities. So it's everything what, where we're at in terms of the ISSP. But also it's about securing social capital and leveraging social capital in order to develop this, this, this whole idea of the ideas economy. But very much shifting around this commercialization issue. And again, these are the sort of five areas in terms of the short-term challenges, building the, the ideas economy, enhancing the, the, the environment and security energy, critical infrastructure, and providing efficient and public and smart regulations. And if you look at that document, if you get a chance to it, it's an appallingly written document. It is you know, a, a one that has a laundry list of your know, strengths and weaknesses, and again, it lacks you know, some degree of coherency as, as a key major document for investment in, in, in this area. But then, well, what do they mean by the smart economy? So this is it. It's everything. It's basically you know, high-value rewarding jobs, a thriving entrepreneurial culture, or being a destination of choice of foreign capital, right down to an equitable society, a smart economy, low carbon, and all of that. It's everything. But what's very, very interesting about that attributes, innovation isn't mentioned once in terms of the discourse, right? So here you are, all of your policy agenda, all of your strategies is about ambition around innovation and being an ideas that come. And in some senses, you know, innovation isn't in there explicitly. And if you are organizing and from a policy point of view, you're saying, okay, you want to build an economy that's very much incentivizing innovation and uh, creativity, and, and, you know, and that has an impact right across economic and social, this is a catch-all for everything. So as a policymaker, as someone in, in the, the, you know, maybe punishing in these areas going forward, you know, that is some challenge to make sense of that. Like th sure. this, yeah? There's an interesting thing around, who wrote that document there um, yes. when it was written and everything else. That, that's not written by, uh, that's written by a plan. As a single plan with no consultation process. Yeah. Was it that an environmental? Yeah, yeah. 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 And again, you look at it in terms of the wording, again, it's, important. Again, it's, it's about output, it's about activity. There's no sense in terms of, if you're spending 8.3 billion, you'd expect to say, okay, well, what is the return? This is a policy document. Okay, well, what will it create in terms of job creation? What will be the impacts, both hard and, and soft? And again, this is, you know, as, you know from policy. And again, it's, you know, there's nothing about, if you're trying to create an ideas economy, it's about underpinning individuals, communities, you know, irrespective of where they sit in, in the economy, to be looking at in terms of their perspective in a totally different light. So you might be, uh, you know, in, in terms of gerontology, but you're, you're looking at in terms of, okay, well, how does the state and how does policy making sort of support that sort of activities and what you want to do in terms of from an innovation perspective. But the reality is, I suppose, we have been successful despite all of these apparent contradictions in terms of from a policy point of view. So every year, I suppose, um, from a European innovation scorecard is me measured in terms of how each, each country, in terms of the OECD countries and, and EU countries, do in terms of their innovation performance. And it's very much looking at innovation from a hard metrics point of view. So you're looking at in terms of uh, knowledge drivers, knowledge creation, innovation, applications, and intellectual property. A surprise, surprise, you're seeing in terms of the investment by the state has paid off in terms of funding around innovation. But you're seeing significant gaps in terms of product innovation, venture capital, and business and public uh, expenditure in terms of R&D is, is very, very low. And again, it's reflected in, in 0, 7, 0, 8. But key strengths are in terms of the human capacity, the throughput in terms of economic effects, and the strong growth in terms of doctoral uh, graduates. So where does this put us in terms of the big scoreboard that a lot of policymakers internationally, and also a sort of uh, companies that are looking at investing in Ireland, is that it very much pushes us in terms of the innovator uh, uh, followers category. And the policy ambition is to be uh, up here in terms of with the likes of Japan, Sweden, uh, Denmark. 
but that requires you know, a significant uh, you know, increase in terms of investment. But more interestingly is that you're looking at now that the, you know, that you're looking at in terms of the hard measures of innovation, but also you're looking at the soft measures. And again, you see in terms of that Ireland actually comes out quite well in terms of being a very creative society and creative climate. So well, why is that important? Because there's no point in putting in or investing in uh, sort of assets in, 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 a, in a state uh, if there isn't a climate for this continual improvement, this creativity, and you look at it in terms of you know, this ability to challenge uh, new ways and, and create new ways of, of doing business or dealing with social problems. And then you see in terms of just where the public sort of investment has actually pushed us in terms of the higher education expenditure for very much from sort of 24 to 13 in six years. But you know, to get up to, let's say, number five or six, it doesn't just take money. It takes a significant fundamental <coughs> structural change within society and policy making it at all levels. Then you look at entrepreneurial activity in terms of innovation performance. You look at nascent entrepreneurs, new firm entrepreneurs, early stage and established entrepreneurs, and you see that we're actually very, very highly ranked in terms of OECD. And this is from, let's say, 2004, 2007, where the rate of new startups per month was like 2,800. The reality is, you go that high, if you're looking at from 0, 07 to 2010, I would say the rate is ever going to fall off quite significantly, and more so than other economies. Interestingly, then, as you look at innovation within sort of uh, different aspects in, in, in relation to internationalization, and you see is that we've compared quite well to the US in terms of actually coming up with new novel products that you know, aren't out there, that we're not coming and just replicating or having a, a different add-on to a, another product that's already out there. So that you're seeing is that we're looking at, in terms of a totally new maybe set of, of products and services, and also you're looking at you know, innovation around uh, you know, dealing with, with customers. But that's one element of it, so in terms of just the softer ones. Then you, all the ways you look at measuring sort of how effective the national innovation system is output measures. So, you know, in terms of hard intellectual uh, properties. And this is everything from patents, licensing, all of these sort of things. And really what you're seeing is that Ireland is, is very much uh, very weak at, at, at that. Because, I suppose, a lot of, let's say, the intellectual property that's generated by foreign direct multinationals is actually either sort of registered in the patent office in the US, Korea, uh, or, or Japan. It wouldn't, they wouldn't be going to the Irish patent office to protect it because those uh, uh, economies have stronger uh, sort of legal systems. And what you're seeing here is that Ireland is actually very pathetic in terms of patent office. So you look at Germany, you look at the United Kingdom, France, Poland, and all that, and you look at Ireland, it's, it's actually very, very low down. And you look at a lot of the Eastern European countries are, are, are worse off than us. But interestingly, what you're seeing is that because of the state investment in, in innovation, is that the mix is changing between business, university, and also in terms of others. So you know, that is seen, you're seeing an, an impact in terms of it's just not all business that universities are you know, uh, registering patents. And again, you know, this is you know, for an 8.3 uh, million euro investment. So for every 200 million euro that you invest in science, technology, and innovation as a state, you'd expect to have a run rate of somewhere of maybe between five and 10 startups. You'd need to look at in terms of patents, you're looking at maybe, maybe between one and five. So there are actually out, out there sort of international benchmarks and we're nowhere near in terms of, of that yet. If you look at innovation at a firm level activity, uh, what you're seeing is in terms of various different things is that this is from uh, the four frost surveys again let's just to give you a flavor of it is that over half firms were classified as innovative active and again that's sort of the big sectors are computers communications engineering and, and services ones you look at then how does that break down in terms of different elements of, of, of innovation so you look at product innovation uh, so you're saying, here you are coming up with a new uh, bottle of water or whatever it is. Uh, so about only about nearly 40% of firms. Process innovation, which is very easier to do, about nearly 50%. Organisation innovation, very, very high, 42%. And that is something that is overlooked in terms of from the policymakers. It is about, you know, this continual improvement here. is that you're changing maybe your organisational structure. You're looking at developing new business models, different ways of, of doing things. And then you're looking at collaborative innovation. So here you have all of this sort of rhetoric that comes out and says, oh, business and universities should work more. And here is the figure. 6.8% of enterprises collaborate with public infrastructure. And if you go back to Lundvall's argument, it is about private and public infrastructure and, and this, this collaboration and competitiveness together. 
And you see that figures. So you look at the states and other economies, that figures a lot higher. And particularly when you're looking at a small open economy, that level of, of innovation collaboration has to be a, a, a lot higher. And again, you look at in terms of the impacts and barriers to innovation, you know, they're, they're very, very typical in terms of what you'd find. So where does that leave us in terms of management uh, capability? So I mentioned organisation capability is about 42%, very, very high. And you look at in terms of ID Ireland, or selling Ireland as this uh, you know, knowledge, knowledge in our nature, and as the thumbprint in terms of the Irish DNA. And if you look at any of the sort of foreign direct investment uh, surveys that those companies would do in Ireland, it is about the management capability. So what companies have found is when they have offshored activities to, let's say, India, China, is that it, from a cultural point of view, those uh, sort of managers tend to escalate issues up to corporate very, very rapidly, whereas Irish managers and Irish management capability tend to have the capability to resolve those issues locally and also have the ability to go and aggressively look at where they can get new opportunities and aggressively look at in terms of extending the, the local mandate. <laughs> But the reality for a lot of companies is about the survival of the safest. Is that think of it in terms of any context, that organisations are, 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 and the current sort of management structures and organisational structures, you know, are sort of controlling in terms of the new ideas. So in terms of, when you look at only one of nine, uh, one, uh, one in ten innovations made to the marketplace in any organisation, the big players in terms of from an economic point of view. If you look at sort of new innovations in terms of social and, and, and the social space, how many new ideas, uh, in terms of new product, new services, new ways of, of looking at issues, how many of them actually find their way in terms of from policy implementation? So run rate in economic innovation is one out of every 10 sort of innovations makes it to the marketplace. So the attrition rate is, is quite high. And the danger is, is that organizations you know, well, you know, are very, very, can be very, very conservative and really you know, don't encourage good ideas. But I suppose then the competitive reality is that you know, when a competitor comes into the market with a product offering, you say, well, you know, we really repeatedly squashed this idea for almost 10 years, but now our competitor is launching it. Let's drop everything else and ship it in July. Okay? This very much reactive nature to innovation. And again, I would say also in terms of policy. So you look at the smart, the smart society and smart economy, we're all talking about it. That is very much a reactive sort of policy document to an economic issue. And this is, I suppose, the reality for sort of a lot of companies, you know, smaller ones in terms of what they need to do. Julian Burkenshaw and others have been talking about, well, actually, an important element of innovation in terms of all of these issues, and something that underpins it, is about management innovation. And this cuts across economic and social innovation. So if you take sort of balanced development, you look at in terms of communities, you look at how sort of voluntary groups, how are how do they govern, how do they structure themselves, how do they allocate different activities, but how do they actually engage with the different communities that they're or the different stakeholders that they're charged with? And really you're looking at in terms of the reality is that the old governance structures, the old management structures, the command and control structures that maybe we've all experienced to some, some or lesser extent have fundamentally failed us. They fundamentally failed us and you look at the banking sector as a classic example of that and the, how that has a ripple effect right across uh, both e e economic, e from an economic and social perspective. And the thinking now is that you're looking at in terms of in the, a manager's role is not in terms of, yes, it's about planning, leading, organizing, and controlling, but also it's about enabling people to uh, you know, achieve and to be highly innovative. It's about unleashing the personal creativity of individuals, rather than saying, okay, well, we're going to induct you into the organization, we're going to actually tell you this is the way you're going to think, and, and be in all, all of that. But also it's looking at in terms of taking sort of the sort of perspectives around sports psychology, and about, uh, say, let's say, you look at the Lions rugby match, Game on, on a Saturday, but you look at that, you know, when Brian O'Driscoll or any of these players come off the pitch, they get a CD of these are the phases of play that you've done well, these are phases of play that you actually need to improve your performance. You take that type of analogy and type of approach as a manager in a, in a sort of a social or economic setting, and saying, okay, well, how can you, like uh, Joker talks about, continually improve uh, your own individual performance, then, then that has an impact on a spillover effect in terms of the, the bigger plates. But also is to understand sort of the, the practice and management issues 
and the way is in terms of how you've been very successful. So what have been, is it in terms of the individuals, is it the conditioning? What are the things that actually make you very, very successful from a high performance perspective? So, started to wrap up. What do I see as in terms of the policy implications? So here we are, to be quite honest with you, is that we've been very, very lucky in terms of economic activity. So we've got the balance of the ball. We've also been fortunate to some extent in terms of you know, between Colton and, and also other reports going back and, and more recent ones, that there's been some thinking around what innovation and what should our economy evolve to uh, from this exploitation of other people's activities. And here you have this very, so if you don't have a clear, singular view of what is your future direction, that is going to be very, very complex in terms of well, what you're trying to achieve in terms of, well, are we going to be a commercialization hub or are we going to try and drive this innovation culture within our economy? And there are very, very distinct ways that you actually begin to invest in terms of the assets of, of the state, in terms of to enable that and to other actors. And the reality is that I would see it from you know, coming off the fence is that we won't, we, at most, we'll say in terms of innovation follower, if you look at that sort of big diagram, or we could fall behind and become an innovation laggard. Is that the investment that we've put in has brought us up to a certain level. Because uh, the economic current difficulties, it's going to be harder to maintain that, that level from a political and a policy making point of view. Also, you have a skewedness of, of, of thinking because you want to appeal to a foreign direct investment and also you want to appeal to European entrepreneurs in, you know, similarly. So the way you incentivize both of those you know, can be maybe in some ways at cross purposes at some levels, but also there's some degree of commonality. What I would say is in terms of the national ambition around innovation. So you look at social innovation, you look at economic innovation. Social innovation seems to have fallen off the table from back in 2006, when it was a very, very clearly stated in the strategy for science, technology, innovation. Doesn't mean that there will be spillover effects, but it's off the agenda, it would appear. You look at it in terms of greater actor collaboration. So you look at all of these public policy and state agencies competing after the same, or, or, or competing to after getting after the same stakeholder group. If you look at it in terms of entrepreneurship, you have everything from Enterprise Ireland, County Enterprise Boards, FOSS, a whole lot of other sort of uh, plethora of, of state agencies. You look at it in terms of the social innovation uh, space, and you look at it in terms of lack of coherency, you know, right across the different policy areas, in terms of competing for to try and have the interventions in the same policy areas. Why? Because there, I would argue that there's a lack of joined up thinking in terms of the solid mentality still exists in a lot of uh, sort of policy making thinking. So one of the things that Tony Blair did when he came into power in 97 in, in the UK, he set up the PM's strategy unit. And the strategy unit within, that, that, uh, in, within his office was to look at in terms of greater, greater holistic thinking. Also thinking long term about well, what are the societal and economic issues we need to tackle from social justice, criminal justice, uh, look at in terms of inequality, social cohesion, all of those sort of bigger issues that you know, requires both sort of, uh, you know, and how is he populated that uh, sort of PM unit is you know, from consultancies, academics, uh, sort of policy makers, uh, and also different anthropologists, all these sort of different people to look at within the uh, sort of planning unit to look at the bigger, broader issues so that you have some degree of, of framework in terms of what way is, is your society developing. Also, you know, there's a lot of things we can do in terms of you know, trying to inc uh, incentivize behavior. So, you know, while it might be you know, sort of maybe not politically correct to think about you know, withdrawing social welfare from individuals, you know, it, it's not maybe politically correct or you know, even to be thinking of that way. But you look at it in terms of, sort of some of the social policies in the UK, it's very much trying to say, well, you know, all the support in the world hasn't worked in terms of you know, prevention or all of that. So are there other ways that we can actually more uh, sort of firmly deal with you know, sort of behaviours right across sort of the, the economy? Then you look at it in terms of investment in management and innovation capacity right across the economy. So if you're spending, you know, if the state is spending so much money on state services, and also that that has a spillover effect, then you've got to have a better management capability. Also, you need to be looking at it in terms of how do you actually spot uh, managers right across the social economic space and saying, okay, well, what are the two or three thousand 
uh, you know, top, potentially top of foreign managers and actually you know, investing in terms of them rather than investing in companies or that, that might be another way of looking at it. And also in terms of the innovation capacity within the public and private uh, sector and also I would argue as a radical reform of the education system. So we as social sciences should have a maybe, a, a maybe an understanding of how biotechnology works, how nanotechnology works, because you know, in order to have an understanding in terms of the behaviours that, that, that you know, you know, in terms of the interventions, in terms of products and services. The business implications I would see is in terms of we're really, really in a fight to retain our foreign direct multinational base. We are the envy of a lot of countries because we have the top players in the world located here. The big challenge that they face is, well, how do we actually extend our mandate from, we don't want it like to be like the Dell situation where you know, we, we lose you know, two or 3,000 people, is how do we actually incentivize innovation? How do we get them to say, okay, bring their intellectual property assets into Ireland so it can be exploited? You look at it in terms of SMEs. So if, if you went to an SME and said, look, I have a PhD in social sciences, you know, give me a job. How, how would an SME utilise your skills and services and your capabilities? So that is a big issue and it's even a bigger issue in terms of the science technology area. And also in terms of, you know, do they have a you know, agreed understanding in terms of innovation? And really I suppose from researchers, and again it goes back to a sort of Ross point, is very, you know, you're in a, each one of you is competing against each other in some shape or form for jobs. Be it in terms of the academic space or in terms of the broader societal space. You have to have something that is very, very distinctive, a contribution, but also the reality for a lot of you is that you would be looking at mobility. So you're looking at in terms of a portfolio career, possibly, in terms of, uh, you know, in, in terms of going forward. And also is that to be aware in terms of your, you know, be commercially aware of your value. If I look at in terms of science and technology graduates, uh, which I'd be familiar with in terms of from a research point of view, is that they are, if they commercialise their research and continue on to have maybe a 30 or 40 year career, economically they're worth more than a hospital consultant can earn over their lifetime. So if they commercialise, if they're involved in patent protection, is that they have uh, a greater economic value. And this is, I suppose, one of the big uh, issues in terms of the economy is that we're producing graduates like, like you. And are they going to actually deploy it and be utilised in other economies, not in terms of uh, have these are casts in our, in our economy? Innovation and smart economy, I believe, is about maximising both economic and social outcomes and being very, very deliberate and strategic in terms of that approach. It's also it's about sustaining sort of competitiveness. It is about having a very strong economic competitive base that you're actually competing very, very effectively with. But also very, very interesting in terms of sort of listening in terms of uh, from the other research centres and, and uh, you know, who would be more involved in terms of the social innovation space under the ISSP locally here. I think it's also about creating resilience. I know some of you in terms of your literature would talk about in terms of resilience around social capital and all of that. And it is about creating that resilience at individual level, but also it's about growing capability, you know, a, a holistic capability around sort of management capability, but also sort of I call T&I expertise. So you have sort of very T expertise in terms of broad understanding and, and individual expertise. Uh, or, you know, you, I suppose the science and engineering sort of graduates have very much an I expertise in a particular discipline area. And again, this is about sort of the long-term social and economic resilience and capability, because I suppose we're hitting the, the end of the runway very, very much in terms of our economic activity over the next number of years, and uh, you know there's a lot of challenges ahead. The real sort of question that I would see, the policy issue that I would leave with, is around uh, the national innovation system. So we see in terms of the policy has shifted. We see that in terms of economic innovation, you know, is at a level that, you know, makes us reasonably internationally competitive. But is the current national innovation system robust, responsive, and su sufficiently sustainable to respond to the fundamental structural changes in organisational structures, collaborative innovation approached at a firm level? And more importantly, how does it support and maximise social and public activities? If you look at the banking sector, if I said to you last year, the banking sector and the financial sector we turn its head within a short number of months, no one had believed you. I think we're absolutely in, a, in an era for the next number of, of uh, months and years of this real fundamental change of everything that you, you know, sort of believe or you conceptualise understand about the world is fundamentally changing. Rapidly because of you know, economic issues, but also you look at governments now are 
begin to tackle and think of doing unthinkable things by like maybe removing the welfare state by saying to individuals well it's absolutely acceptable if uh, you know from a sort of from a services point of view if maybe 100 or 200 people you know don't get to any on time that is an acceptable cost in terms of the way we're going to structure our services it's also maybe acceptable in terms of you know like the baby pee case that you know we draw our money in terms of uh, you know sort of aggressively in terms of prevention rather than dealing with the underlying issues in terms of societal issues. And again, you know, these are sort of big sort of policy issues. And I suppose maybe it is, in other words, I don't have a slightest idea in terms of what that return will be. So what the challenge for, for all of us is in terms of to begin to map out what that return is in terms of maximising the public and social good activities. Thanks very much.